Hello and welcome to the British Association for South Asian Studies podcast series. In an attempt to stay connected with our ever-expanding international membership, we are adding more and more content related to our events online. To find out more about membership to BASIS and the work of the association, please visit our website at www.basis.org.uk. We hope you enjoyed today's podcast and hope to see you at one of our events soon. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm going to try it without the microphone. It's probably just as easy. I think my voice might carry. So uh, firstly, can I just welcome you all to Cambridge on behalf of the university. It's a brilliant occasion for us to, to host a dual celebration, the 30th anniversary and the 50th anniversary of our very own centre here in Cambridge is really something very special indeed. And so my real thanks also go to the centre's di director. This is not a, a sort of mutual loving, but believe me, she has been an absolute champion to make sure that the Centre for South Asian Studies here in Cambridge remains one of the most vibrant institutions that we have, particularly in the area of international studies. So Joe, to you and to all staff, congratulations for all that you've achieved. Now, the Centre's library and, ar and archive house a collection of unique materials. Uh, the MPhil programme is thriving, its research seminars and film streamings amazingly attended. Um, and I do hope you will have the chance to visit the Centre because it really is quite special and it's located in a way with other studies so that we really can get real interdisciplinarity between a variety of people uh, looking at different parts of the world. <coughs> So, for me, this centre uh, enshrines something that is very important. For me, it's about a university looking outwards, looking at other cultures and engaging in a global activity, which is both centred inside the institution of the University of Cambridge, but also helps us promote the international dimension of the, the university itself. Um, when I arrived in Cambridge in 2010, it was uh, really quite interesting that I had in my office the usual array of artifacts that uh, um, remain from past incumbents of the office. But there was one artifact I could not resist keeping um, in, in the office. And that is something that was presented to the university 20 years ago, and that is a bronze uh, head of Gandhi. And it's something that we still have, and I keep it in the office to keep reminding myself of what he was able to achieve uh, through debate, through discussion, and through peaceful means. Something that today is really very important. And I keep on rem remembering a particular quote of his that has always stuck with me. And that is, learn as if you were to live forever. You just ponder that for a moment, but just how important that statement is that you always keep learning, you never ever stop. But our, our engagement with South Asia is really very real as a university. I can give you the numbers. Uh, we have 270 active programs in India at the present time. Now remember, we're a small university, there are only 1,400 academic staff. It covers all disciplines. We now have a setup where we work with India with an advisory board uh, in India. We actually have five centers now established, major research centers, not just in the sciences, which would not come as a surprise to you, but particularly in the arts and humanities, where we engage always with South Asian partners in, in order to be able to promote that activity, particularly with a strong research bias. My ambition for you, Joya, is that the next centre that we open, either in India or in South Asia, is going to be a direct extension of your institution to take us the next 50 years to when you'll be able to celebrate uh, your centenary. Now, one of the uh, frustrations of being Vice-Chancellor is that you can only get to snapshots of meetings. Believe me, I would have loved to be with you through the whole course uh, of these meetings that you've held. I can already see from the titles how exciting they've been. And just walking here, I was able to meet one of the delegates and was able to hear of her excitement uh, at the debates that were taking place. But I am really privileged to be able to introduce one of our alumni, if you would allow me to, to say that, William, uh, to whose lecture today is really fantastic. Hidden Citizens, Space, Place and Rights 
in India and Pakistan. And maybe what we learn from India and Pakistan is something that is going to be a message to many of us from many other countries. Now they say that you can get the man out of Cambridge, but we hope that you can't get Cambridge out of the man. Uh, tonight's lecturer is a distinguished Cambridge alumnus. He studied for his BA and MPhil at Pembroke College and completed his PhD at Trinity. Appropriately, William was the Smuts Research Fellow in Commonwealth Studies at the Center of South Asian Studies between 2000 and 2003. He left, fortunately left us, but is now the Professor of Indian History at Leeds University, where he was telling me he's establishing a very strong group in South Asian work itself, and I do hope we would be able to celebrate with you the establishment of your own South Asian Centre. And you've published widely on so many top subjects of contemporary relevance, including Hindu nationalism, uh, corruption, citizenship, and marginalization and criminalization of tri uh, tribal groups in both colonial and post-colonial India. So you've heard enough from me. You want to hear from the star of the evening. William, over to you. And thank you so much for, for being here with us today. Thank you very much. Um, it's, it's really a great honor to be asked to give this lecture. And I'd just like to say, uh, particularly given the, the two anniversaries of the 13, 50 years, having spent some time myself working at the Center of South Asian Studies uh, and the fond memories I have of the center, uh, I'd just also like to say, before I start, that um, if, I, if I look like I'm flagging at any point, um, during, during the lectures because um, we had an unexpected arrival, uh, a, ba a new baby, uh, just over a week ago. So I, uh, I haven't had as much sleep as I, I would have had. But anyway, we'll see. <laughs> Although as far as I know, he never wrote um, any songs about India or Pakistan, the passing of David Bowie this year showed how the general public every, everywhere is exercised over a great celebrity death. The extraordinary thing about such events is not just what they reveal about public opinion, but how the dead are exploited by those attempting to form it. And of course one of the most exploited celebrity deaths of, of all in India is of course that of M.K. Gandhi. Although we might say that his death is also a source of confusion, at least for some in the ruling regime in India at the moment who can't decide whether to celebrate the man himself or his assassin. On the 30th of January 1948, Gandhi shooting by a member of the right-wing RSS set off a series of events which allowed the new post-colonial regime to consolidate itself, ban various organisations and strengthen the Prime Minister's authority. Conversation turned to one subject across the world. The pioneer newspaper of Lucknow reported how Pakistan's government offices were closed for monster condolence meetings in Karachi. Even Britons, it reported, were shocked out of their usual phlegm. Less well known, despite Yasmin Khan and Mira Deb's work, is how Gandhi's passing was experienced in public spaces, streets, parks and cafes. The huge state funerals passed through the grand colonial spaces of Delhi involving throngs of onlookers, estimated at over a million. Tree branches hung with the burden of people. After the lighting of Gandhi's pyre on the evening of the 31st of January, Nehru himself was pictured saving more enthusiastic souls from falling into the fire. At the specific site where the Mahatma had fallen, uh, where the Mahatma had died, considered by many to be sacred, people gathered up handfuls of the earth, leaving a large hole in the ground. It was later covered by a huge slab of concrete. Across virtually every Indian city, mass funeral processions are followed. At Jamshedpur, a labourer was stunned to death on hearing the news. Subsequently, the Congress High Command assisted in the distribution of Gandhi's ashes to the India's main rivers and sites of communal violence, in the process extending regime authority outwards. Eight months later, in Pakistan, on the 11th of September 1948, Pakistan's own Khairi Azam, M.A. Jinnah, passed away. The ceremonies in their aftermath were strikingly similar. The reported one million people gathered in the city who lined the three-mile-long funeral route the following day were credited with behaving in the main with admirable discipline, <coughs> though, as one British embassy report noted, the vast crowds who swarmed around the beer at one point completely disorganised the official programme. In an interesting and perhaps telling inversion of events in India, British Pathé News film 
newsreel filmed the sea of people attending Jenna's funeral and showed mourners apparently scattering soil that had been brought from all over the new nation onto his grave. In contrast then to the nationwide distribution of Gandhi's ashes, this ceremony materially and metaphorically sought to connect in symbolic fashion the country's constituent parts with its political centre in Karachi. Whereas the Congress realised the need to extend its authority outwards to other states in the lead up to the first general elections, in Pakistan the problem was still one of the need or desire to centralise. But in both states it was important to retain a monopoly over the Gandhi or Jinnah brand. In Bombay in 1950, the local government refused to certify a cigarette film advert for Cavender cigarettes, which put Gandhi's photograph behind smokers in a cloth shop, which the adverts claimed dispelled the anger of the mother-in-law with the smoke of the cigarette. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, there were reports of Jinnah's face on ads for Badshahi Bidis, and in a similar fashion, in 1950, a disgruntled Karachi resident complained that, although the government had prohibited it, a medicine Jinnaspirin is being openly sold. <laughs> in Salman Rushdie's Midnight Children, the siblings Salim and Jamila represent the two nation states born in mid August 1947. Parallel, interconnected, the one explaining so much and the other. But surprisingly, even though historians of empire have explored the porosity of national and imperial boundaries, there's probably less work than you might expect comparing India and Pakistan in the same frame. Tony Valentine's Translocal Connections, the idea of imperial networks and the new imperial history have not easily traversed South Asia's borders. Fred Cooper's Federal Moment for French Africa is not extended to South Asia, even though some of its arguments are pertinent to the options of an undivided India proposed in 1946. This lack is surely not for want of material about the two states' intimate connections, we might explore the painful consolidation of the princely states and its controversies. British pilots gun running overnight from Karachi, Pakistan to Hyderabad, India. The mountain trails through the Kashmir Valley and the state of constant war there in Nehru's heartland. We might follow the channels of water controversy down the Indus or the slowly emerging nuclear conflict. But as powerful as warheads, valleys and rivers, is what Arundhati Roy describes as the politics of the small dismantling the big. And one of the big defining ideas of the modern world, as it were, that we've been learning about quite a lot today in the conference and many different panels, at least of its nation states, is that of the citizen. Like the popular disruption of the Gandhi and Jinnah funerals, however, it's an idea that's in const a constant state of dismantling, remaking, challenge, reinterpretation or appropriation by the small or the local and contingent. An interesting question then is how the precipitate division of India and Pakistan in 1947 formed the mindset of the citizen and further how the mutual coexistence of both places changes, channels and challenges those mindsets. Now this is something that I've spent quite a lot of time discussing with um, Sarah Ansari with whom I'm writing a book on the subject and Sarah has given me permission to cite our joint work, our joint work which was based in, um, as many of you probably would be aware, a, a project that we started in 2007. It was funded by the EHRC. It was called From Subjects to Citizens. I've just taken a, a shot from the, from the webpage there. And this work was very much influenced by the extraordinarily rich literature that emerged really from the mid to late 1990s, particularly around partition and citizenship in South Asia. The importance of this work is not just in its unpacking of the complex, intimate lives of those who moved in 1947. It also unsettles our notion of boundary, the border and the nation. Not least here, is, of course, has been Joy Chatterjee's work on how formal definitions of the citizen were decided by partition migration. The many brilliant examples of new research and recent PhD work on refugee politics, resettlement and migration, much of which, um, we've, again, is featured in, in, uh, in the conference over the last couple of days. Relevant too is Oli Godsmark's work on the regional variations of citizenship discourses across India, or Vazira Zamindar's examination of the long process of partition via bureaucratic modes of controlling national belonging, not least in the passport. But of course citizenship is more than just what can be described by the formal documents of belonging and identity. Permits, passports, fixed properties are negotiated over time and sometimes the process itself is more the reflection of a citizen's rights than the rubber stamp that follows. 
And it's this negotiation in its circumstances in two interrelated regions across the border in the late 1940s and early 50s, Uttar Pradesh, India, and Sindh, Pakistan, that is going to form the subject of my lecture. Like James Holston, who's explored citizenship in Brazil, I'm going to differentiate between formal citizenship, something defined by membership of the nation state, and substantive citizenship, the array of civil, political, socio-economic and cultural rights people possess and exercise. Formal citizenship is no guarantee of substantive citizenship rights, and as we will see, some communities have often had to devise different kinds of strategies to ensure them. This invocation of citizenship rights doesn't occur in a readily prescribed place. The village, neighbourhood, state, and especially the city might be its scope, even simultaneously. No place is an island. The late Raj Chandavaka, in his critique of urban history, urged us to avoid cutting cities out of their hinterlands, connections that could well be international in scope. In many important respects for India and Pakistan, this is especially the case where older networks of connections between places were cut by a new border. The links between Lahore and Amritsar, for example, were transformed as Ian Talbot writes from interconnected Punjabi heartland cities to borderlands. The idea of the perpetual sibling rivalry between the two states of Pakistan and India then has boxed our ideas around the nation. David Gellner et al, their, their book Borderline Lives in South Asia, in applying and critiquing borderland theory for South Asia, have also questioned this tendency to think in terms of the nation. And historians need to follow suit. As late as March 1947, there was no certainty that partition should or would result from the decolonisation of British India. There were always scope for alternatives. Today, then, I'm going to suggest um, that citizenship is not just about a notion of belonging to one place, but how one city or locality relates to others and other people and goods in other localities. For India and Pakistan, ideas of citizenship were strongly marked in this relational way as a dynamic of each post-colonial state's formation in the late 1940s. At an obvious and by now quite well explored level, this was about the demonisation of certain minorities seen as belonging to the neighbouring state. Despite the nature of uniform rights, eventually granted in India's constitution, some groups were required to volunteer expressions of loyalty as a means of maintaining and securing their citizenship. For others, such rights were automatic and hence invisible. In the case of Pakistan, the religious rationale for its existence raised question marks from the outset as to how or where minorities fitted into the new political equation, notwithstanding Jinnah's 11th of August speech in Karachi. These challenges had particularly serious implications for Muslims in India, for example, those on the margins of normal citizenship rights, and likewise for non-Muslims in Pakistan. But today I'm going to explore these processes less from the point of view of migrants and refugees, and more via the things that flowed out of this movement more broadly. Rather like the current evacuation of Syria, the movement of people under stress says something equally interesting, perhaps more interesting, about the societies that receive the displaced. Throughout my talk is going to look at the relationship between vernacular and relatively hidden ideas of the citizen in their relationship to larger discourses and how the latter often controls the former. As Ellen and you begin, Iona Datta and Pavis Modi have argued, India's formally constituted and far-reaching fundamental rights ultimately privileged a state patriarchy of double standards, gender equality in the public domain which bolstered religious community in the private. Alongside or complicating this, as Roshna Bajpai and Ornik Shani have shown, were multiple forms of alternative group rights. But as I will explain as I go along, I'm a little bit more interested today in the more mundane and performative local manifestations of citizenship in a period in which some of these apparent certainties about the state were still not set, or was in the process of being formed. This is partly about temporal scale. The formation of the citizen involves, involves a reflection on past forms of colonial repression and a series of forward-looking utopias centred on ideas of freedom and responsibility. But in the period I would examine, these were still very much up in the air and uncertain, not least because of the unsettled relationship between the two new states. My lecture accordingly explores two examples of how the immediate aftermath of 1947 generated different kinds of citizenship politics or movements in both India and Pakistan. Firstly, the idea of the citizen 
in publicity, particularly in the press and newspapers, that juxtapose the politics of community with that of governance. And I'm going to look at this specifically in relation to the ways in which minorities in each state were demonised through, through that, um, that kind of public sphere of the press. Secondly, I'm going to look at the idea of the citizen that emerged through the changing politics of corruption surrounding goods, their control and movements. And what I'm going to try to show throughout the lecture is how popular ideas of citizenship were imagined and experienced and circulated in both places simultaneously and in ways that were mutually reinforcing. On the 18th of April 1948, the main newspapers in the Indian province of Uttar Pradesh reported on what it described as the highly unusual case of a 19-year-old woman from the town of Gorakhpur by the name of Gayatri. The young woman had created a stir in the city magistrate's court in a case in which a man named Mohan was being tried for her abduction. She declared that it was in fact she who had abducted her paramour and not the other way around and went into a long description of how she had persuaded him to come away with her. I'm perfectly entitled, she declared in the court, to choose a husband for myself. The sensation and implied humour in this story was that religion seemed irrelevant. It was simply a matter of a man being abducted by a woman. Alongside the supposed abduction, much more column space was dedicated to partition migrants marked by religion. The thousands of non-Muslims being evacuated from Sindh every day, the restrictions of sale, not just of evacuee properties in India, but properties identified clearly with the Muslim community. In the same issue of the Hindi newspaper Arj as the Gayatri story, were accounts of electoral intimidation of Muslims. But most pertinent to the love story was the common reporting on the state recovery of thousands of abducted women between India and Pakistan that took place during the partition. The day after Gayatri appeared in the Gorakhpur court, India and Pakistan concluded an agreement at an inter-Dominion conference. Each government decided that any official guilty in their duties towards the lives and properties of minorities should be punished. Minorities defined by virtue of their religion were automatically then the concern of the other state. Yet around the marking of these minorities in India's newspapers, we get a sense of the relationship between this politics of post-partition and the mundane affairs of other citizens. People like Gayatri and Mohan, who just wanted to get on with the routine, but no less important business of falling in love. Whether they wanted it or not, the lovers were tangled up in the larger politics of post-partisan citizenship. But also thinking about Veena Das's life and words and Purvis Modi's intimate state, we might think of this in terms of how large-scale violence silences the everyday. In this case, the agency of Gayatri was repositioned, like Modi's descriptions of staged abductions in contemporary India. But in this case, it was repositioned behind a larger patriarchal focus on community in the state's recovery of women. The way this media obsession with community played out in the regions of Punjab and Bengal is relatively well known. But if we want to know what effect it had on the idea of citizenship in general in South Asia, we would probably want to look elsewhere, to areas affected by partition, but not totally transformed by population displacement. Uttar Pradesh, or UP, although not a not a key landing point for migrants, was the point of origin for the most influential migrants to Pakistan. In total, around 250,000 migrated from UP, with a large proportion going to Sindh and mostly to the larger cities such as Karachi. Moving the other way, Sindhis too were among the most significant and best organised migrants to UP. Karachi was Pakistan's first federal capital, and so much of the wider debate about refugees, their rehabilitation, centred on the city and its provincial hinterland. Perhaps the best reason for looking at Sindh and UP then is that while falling outside the larger scale plans for post-partition rehabilitation in Punjab and Bengal, they were both of symbolic and material significance to larger ideas about, about the citizen. In this sense, they are relational spaces. They have a bearing on the border, but they are not of the border itself. Yet indirectly, both places also epitomise some of the failures and problems of refugee rehabilitation and its effects on others. By April 1948, the total number of refugees in UP had reached around 450,000. And very quickly, the actions of government affected the behaviour of migrants. The promulgation of an ordinance for the registration of refugees encouraged further migrants, brought by, brought by the promises of rehabilitation, adding a further 150,000 unregistered um, refugees. This sense of things running out of control around migrants also applied to Sindh's major cities. By 1951, the time of Pakistan's first census, 
Karachi's population had more than doubled since independence to just over one million. And this generated a myriad of practical problems in a city not designed to accommodate such numbers. Sanitation, public health, water supply and housing were all casualties. There were significant parallels then between the cities of UP and those of Sindh in managing the refugee crisis of late 1947-8. Equally, these cities were comparable and interrelated in their reporting on refugees and migration. It's probably well known to everyone who has lived through the UK's immigration policy since 1948 that the public image of the migrant, especially one defined and contained by official ordinance, flows over into the politics of just about everything else. In India and Pakistan, how people negotiated housing, ration cards, the allocation of permits for business, depended on changing public views of government, and in the, in the latter, minorities with connections to the other states were strongly implicated. This was nowhere better expressed than in the newspapers of UP and Sindh. Newspapers were so important to the development of civic consciousness in the late colonial period, as many of us know, that the British set up an entire machinery to collect, survey and digest the contents of vernacular papers into bi-weekly reports. And very useful they are too. Newspapers are probably also the most effective repositories of scapegoat politics, as we know only too well in Europe. In his study of the role of the media in the rise of the Hindu right in 1990s India, Arvind Rajagopal writes about the changing relationship between communication and political participation in the new liberalised environment of that decade of the 90s. The period immediately following independence was another point, I would argue, when there were suddenly new freedoms of speech to explore the relationship between people and government. This encouraged more detailed press discussions on everyday governance. But most importantly, there were now critiques of what the new citizenship actually meant. Arguably, in Pakistan, the newspaper was even more central to citizenship. In the absence of representative institutions to air grievances, newspapers like Dawn in English, or Jang in Urdu, offered a valuable outlet for the public's irritation. Indeed, Karachi was home to a large proportion of the newspapers published in Pakistan, testifying both to the city's status as the federal capital and its importance as the main centre for political comment and criticism. This changing relationship between communication and the public in India and Pakistan took place during the height of the media's demonisation of minorities. Newspaper scandals surrounding them therefore were readily mixed up with other complaints around local governance. By extension, this automatically allowed the press to connect the urban spaces of India and Pakistan. If we look, for example, at the Lucknow edition of the National Herald or the Hindi newspaper Aj for January to May 1948, we see pages dedicated to the interrelated themes of refugees and Muslim migrants and those of public access to goods, goods and urban services. Food rationing, black marketing, the problems of housing were juxtaposed with or sometimes mixed together with within alleged public concerns about the movement of people, the image of the Muslim or Hindu migrant. Nobody yet was asked to express their loyalty by how loud they could shout Bharat Mata Ki Jai, but through early January 1948, for example, UP's papers described the comparable treatment of Hindu refugees leaving Pakistan with those leaving India, with a former allegedly subject to personal searches by government servants. Invariably, the officers who were directly responsible for the harsh treatment of citizens were linked to the other states. Letters in Karachi's Dawn newspaper from late September also expressed concerns about non-Muslims in key posts. If Indian government can make it a matter of policy not to post non-Hindus at key posts, why can't we, asked one correspondent in Dawn. The newspaper, usually taking a pro-refugee stance, frequently published reports of non-Muslim officers apparently decamping at short notice to India, many taking with them sensitive government papers. It's clear that the predicament of minorities in each state, and especially the category of intending migrants, was influenced by changing public opinion, as it appeared in the press. And what happened in the representation of these groups in one place had a knock-on effect in the other. The departure to Pakistan of the UP Muslim League leader, Chaudhry Kalakazaman, reportedly sent panic waves through a range of Muslim communities, according to Hindi papers, in October 1947. Certainly, Muslims were under constant public verbal attack at this time, stereotyped in cartoons, as well as in the fez, or represented in reports as dangerous fifth columnists. Leaving family members behind in their properties, or you know, getting up to dastardly deeds in the bureaucracy. Very similar views of Hindus in Karachi were common in the press. 
Vizier Zamandar has shown how the Daily Jan became a central mouthpiece, mouthpiece of complaint against first the Sindh administration around housing and secondly around Hindus. And famously, there was a story that was spread in the paper in November and December 1947 that Hindus had deliberately attempted to poison a city water tank. In fact, the newspaper itself became a repository of announcements for lost family members, new addresses, job applications, and stories of what was going on in Delhi. So as well as being, as it were, kind of mouthpiece for the creation of this sort of public demonization of the minority, it was also a point of information uh, for ways in which people could get to find out how to get their work done. In a section of the paper of the of lecture that I, I, I cut out for reasons of time, um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about some of the kind of political figures in India and Pakistan who were, as it were, politically representing or lobbying on behalf of refugee organisations, which fed, very much fed into this demonisation of minorities. For example, P.D. Tandon um, in India, uh, who worked very much strongly on behalf of Sindhi refugee organisations, and Chowdhury Palakasma in Pakistan. I think these figures, these political figures, linked their politics, in the case of Tandon, his politics in, in competition with Nehru, into this changing publicity around minorities. So in Pakistan too, the politics of post-partition migration was mixed up in the newspapers with the idea of the failed promises of citizenship in papers. The frustration experienced by ordinary people during Pakistan's early years is revealed in the writings of Majid Lahori, a journalist and poet who, following his move to Karachi after independence, became a well-known columnist who would talk about everything through the medium of wit and satire. And he had this kind of cast of characters that he could frequently bring up in his poetry that many people were not sure if they were real or, or fictional. In 1948, he began a column that appeared in most Sunday editions of the Urdu language Jain newspaper up to his death in 1957. His obituary described how he took the role of a tribune of the people. He accurately expressed the embittered feelings of the general public, the targets located amongst those whom the Pakistan movement had carried to power, bureaucrats, politicians, black marketeers, allotment grabbers, etc. And here's an extract from his poem, Beggary Was Forbidden But. Get for me a building, get for me a bungalow. Get for me a printing house, get for me a factory. Get for me a petrol pump or cinema, if not a bus, then at least a bus stand. Get for me in the name of the nation, O oh giver, it will be kind of you. It's significant then, I think, that just as questions around the belonging of minorities took place, people were asking more searching questions about government, how government affected everyday lives. There were two significant outcomes of this entangling. Firstly, it sharpened ideas about how the different levels of politics were interconnected. Like Lahori's poems, the unfair allocation of resources at the top affected everybody, everybody at the bottom. Likewise, the events of one place or the movement of one group of people affected those in another place. Secondly, and by extension, it brought into focus this idea that citizenship could be actively critiqued and demonstrated. Or to put it another way, it highlighted the everyday performances of citizenship. This, I would argue, applies in unique ways to India and Pakistan in this late 1940s phase, especially through the newspaper. The ground on which such forms of local politics took place was rapidly changing as the expectations of the state were refreshed and re-expressed. Citizens were learning new approaches to officials, talking more about expectations of government, thinking new about questions of belonging and the responsibilities of leaders. And in a way that interconnected India and Pakistan, as, as I'm going to talk about next, they did, so, they did so through the idea of corruption. In the year 2000, the New York Times ran a story about a man by the name of Lal Bihari from a place called Amilo in the Azagra district. In 1975, Lal Bihari applied for a bank loan against his five-acre plot of land, only to discover that his proof of identity was invalid. The village revenue official told him that he could no longer be who he said he was, since his death was recorded in the registry. The death had apparently been arranged via a bribe by an uncle who had aimed to illegally grab Bihari's ancestral land. The article continued that Lal Bihari would have been less upset if it hadn't been for the fact that he'd been recently having tea with the official on a daily basis. He was, however, aware that if an Indian bureaucrat had certified his demise, it might take him a lifetime to prove that he was not dead. <laughs> Bihari added Ritak, or dead, to his name. He attempted to organise his own funeral, to claim widow's compensation for his wife. 
and from 1980, he started signing letters, the late Lal Bihari. <laughs> His, his methods included assaulting officials, trying to engage in fights, and stealing his uncle's baby. In other efforts to prove that he was alive, he stood for election against Rajiv Gandhi, <laughs> the contest that he lost. Eventually, his legal resurrection was achieved after 19 years of intense public activity, in which time he formed a pressure group, the Association of Dead People, or, or Mritak Sang which um, social media tells us now has 20,000 members nationwide. Others have also been registered dead by their relatives fearing the subdivision of land. By 1994, the UN Bihari's lands were finally recovered. He had at least become a, a, a local popular figure. The article printed his own words. I became the leader of the movement. I knew I had other dead people to save. So this story, um, which is true, <laughs> as you're wondering, um, not, not, not only illustrates um, the forms of legal rights activism that have arisen against corruption in post-colonial South Asia, but also the importance of citizen movements in that process. For example, the Mritak Sang filed right to information applications in 2008 to discover that hundreds of people declared dead were actually legally alive. Anti-corruption itself, Craig Jeffrey suggests, has become a major enterprise in India. And certainly in both the late 1940s and late 1950s and 2000s, its huge variability creates multiple vernacular expressions of rights. There's also a distinct historicism um, to the movement in the last 10 years or so. We could make reference to Anna Hazari's use of Gandhian politics, or Arvind Kajral's references to Swaraj, or um, Modi's own projection of Vallabhai Patel <coughs> as the incorruptible Iron Man of India for whom uh, there, there were plans, I don't know what's happened to it, but there were plans to build this enormous um, kind of world record-breaking statue. In all cases, India's anti-colonial struggles and the moment of independence are often points of reference. I'd argue that some of the features of this form of popular citizens' activism relate back to the early post-colonial period in more profound ways. The late 1940s and early 1950s was a period in which anti-corruption came to vogue, pre precisely because then, new questions about the boundaries of citizenship were being tested and rehearsed. In this, perceptions of time were also crucial. People are rarely unhappy all of the time, even academics, but levels of dissatisfaction can be triggered by sudden changes in circumstances or the failure of a promised better future. And people are never so annoyed or excited as when prices change, or as we all know at the moment, at moments of austerity. The government control or decontrol of essential goods a specific hangover from the days of wartime rationing and controls created a context of change and uncertainty in the late 1940s and early 1950s. In early 1948, in UP, for example, the anticipation of decontrol of goods led to the whole hoarding and growth of black markets. These new opportunities for profit mapped onto bureaucratic structures and networks of political patronage. But such networks were also now open to new kinds of public critique. Historians are, of course, always looking for an archive, and this raises the question of what constitutes an archive of corruption. Cynics have suggested to me that by their very nature, state archives are controlled, censored, or to use the official term often, weeded of their files, and therefore you won't find very much around corruption scandal. But when I started searching in two departments of the UP state archive in particular, those perhaps most associated with the post-colonial project, the Public Works Department and Food and Civil Supply, I found a steady supply of case files of large-scale corruption cases. I also found in the supply records around two dozen personnel records of officers dealing with rationing, food controls, rent controls and evacuee properties. In nearly all of these scandals that connected over time to interviews we conducted crucially were links also to election complaints files of the Indian National Congress in the Timorti archive. In other words, corruption scandals are very clearly related to political patronage. But these scandals are not preserved solely in written records. They're embedded in social practices and cultural discourses. Official documents, too, often record corruption in elliptical or coded ways. At first, the cynics were right. Files were not necessarily forthcoming. But after buying a few cups of tea and a box of sweets for the woman behind the desk, the archivists found files that had hitherto been unavailable. Um, one such file, interestingly, was a detailed list of officers' disciplines for misdemeanors in Uttar Pradesh, 
Um, so they tabulated, you know, people who've been uh, actually dismissed for um, different kinds of corruption, and within that were a large number of officers who'd been members of the RSS, uh, who, when the organisation was banned, were dismissed from service, and many of these officers worked on the railways. In most of the cases I looked at, the can of worms was very wormy indeed, and involved more than one can. It was striking how discussions of corruption in these files were usually based in spatial networks mapped by a power nexus, sometimes real, sometimes imagined, and often in, inter in interrelated cities. When I combined bureaucratic with party political research around elections, this interlocking of different spaces was logical. The maintenance of rent-seeking frequently involved a range of political connections, frameworks of political patronage in which influence spread across multiple localities. C.V. Gupta's um, election complaint file was particularly useful in this respect, uh, in that it connected to all kinds of scandals in the bureaucracy. Given that the citizens' idea of the state were conditioned by the comparative experiences of different places, this translocalism was quite significant. Cement, the symbol of India and Pakistan's post-colonial modernity, the cover of Gandhi's site of death, provides an interesting case study illustrating these interconnections. Not just a symbol though, given the need for new housing with the refugee crisis, cement and its supply was a product constantly discussed in the press. The integrity and safety of buildings, roads, and as we've recently seen in Calcutta, flyovers, is something that directly affects the daily lives of citizens. In the late 1940s and early 50s, UP newspapers, um, people were exercised by the misappropriation of large quantities of building material across different cities of the province, including Agra, Kanpur, and Allahabad, and importantly involving links to officers who left for Pakistan. Police raided the Kanpur Development Office and found registers of cement sold to the board's contractors. Now, although a large proportion of the total UP cement allocation was claimed during 1947 by the development board, the amount of cement consumed was very meagre. The officer of the board who blew the whistle and who was subsequently and conveniently transferred to Delhi reported that the cement allocations were sold in the black market. On the 8th of January 1948, the contractors of the development board involved in the scandal were arrested and several thousand tonnes of cement were retrieved from their warehouses, although some of the illicit profits were allegedly lost to Muslim officers who had migrated to Pakistan. It was significant for public views of this scandal that officers themselves were found to be complicit and part of extensive networks linking cities across the state. One such officer involved was Kevin Mistra, the town rationing officer in the city of Kanpur during the scandal, who had also been transferred between different cities, allegedly for misdemeanours, in the allocation of evacuated property. When faced with investigation, he and other officers mobilised political assistance, moving backwards and forwards between his, uh, his post and Lucknow. In Mistra's file, which I found in the archive, we see that throughout the scandal he made use of the provincial newspapers to counter the negative publicity against the supply office. In so doing, he in turn contributed to the proliferation of scandals that appeared in the press. What struck me as important here was not so much the material theft in a system of rationing or public control of goods. Such features are common to most post-war systems of controls across the world. More interesting for both India and Pakistan, and particularly its cities, was the nature of public discussion of corruption and its effects on the citizen. For this discussion to take place, something needed to be seen to be going badly wrong, and this had to be compared to what appeared to be going right elsewhere. The intercity and international networks that linked the Kanpur cement scandal are one example of that. But at a larger scale, it was no accident that press articles on corruption in the supply bureaucracy in North India were published alongside stories about national and international decisions that were being taken on anti-corruption at high levels. For example, Alongside supply corruption cases in UP papers were stories of Pakistan's anti-corruption ordinances of January 1948, Pakistan's decision to control or decontrol, or the setting up of the Pakistan Special Police Establishment a few months later. Pakistan here then, I would suggest, was a symbol of public interest in what government at other levels or in other places was doing. It was also linked to questions about state power. For example, does corruption flourish or is it more easily stand out in a state with a strong executive or in a new democracy. This comparison, however, was sharpened by another pattern. The sheer number of cases in which government servants from minority communities in each state were accused of corruption. Or to put it more bluntly, 
how corruption was inherently Pakistani if you were in India, or Indian if you were in Pakistan. As early as January 1948, Indian newspapers were tabulating the demography of bureaucratic migration. By the last week of that month, around 30,000 Muslim government servants residing in UP and a further 14,000 from Delhi migrated to Pakistan. This was frequently expressed as a post-colonial clearing out of old colonial corruption. The district supply officer of Kanpur, M.H. Khan, also implicated in the cement scandal, was accused in the press of favouritism towards Muslims. Letters against him made specific references to his disloyalty to the nation as an alleged Muslim leaguer, which meant for the appellants that he must have been a Pakistan sympathiser, working against Indian citizens. Following a corruption inquiry in the Gorakhpur Railway Administration, one MLA said that the followers of Churchill and Jinnah have a great hand in this conspiracy. I requested the former general manager of this railway not to post Muslim leaguers to key posts. Very, a very similar politics can be seen in Sindh, Pakistan. Some of its most intriguing characteristics related to mobile crime between cities, smuggling. This was an offence that represented a direct challenge to the state's new authority, its ability to control the new, increasingly regulated borders that divided India and Pakistani territory. In April 1952, the Pakistan Constituent Assembly passed a bill authorising central and provincial administrations to declare all-out war on smuggling, whose continuation, it asserted, threatened the security of the state. Inevitably, non-Muslims attracted a disproportionate share of the blame in Pakistan. Reports on anti-smuggling initiatives in West Pakistan were issued frequently throughout the late 40s and early 50s, as one report from Dawn put it. The racket of smuggling precious food grains from Jaisalmer to Sindh continues unabated, and are now renewed due to the help of Mr. Ramchand Advani, deputy collector, who has always been notoriously anti-Muslim, and has a long list of unhappy deeds to his credit. Whenever any camels and food grains are intercepted, they return to the smugglers under the influence of Mr. Ramchan. But these accusations of corruption were encoded in other vernaculars in the archive. In the case of the files, we find letters and monster petitions deploring the inadequacy of high-level anti-corruption bodies, directly styling themselves as citizens' movements. These often mirrored the city networks of scandals themselves and expressed notions of citizenship in relation to the same networks and specifically the life of the city, mostly Hindi, some in flowing cursive, some containing large numbers of workers' thumbprints, parallel women's organisations, and expressing civic consciousness often in terms of social justice. Most UP cities developed these movements, which sometimes followed the transfer of particular offices. In the 1950s, some of these, um, in the 1950s, some of these petitions found their way to the press and contained allegations against supply personnel in different cities. The citizens of Balia, for example, wrote about one officer who had allegedly been bribed for a coal permit, that his behaviour was against the principle and honour of our democratic government. Similar letters and petitions were filed against officers in other UP cities, Allahabad, Kanpur, Banaras, Sitapur, Lucknow and Agra. Some of the local protests branched out into wider anti-corruption protests that transcended particular urban centres. For example, the marking of anti-black marketing day in June 1948 and June 1949. In some ways, the appearance of corruption in public discourse in India and Pakistan is down to its value as public entertainment. It forms a central theme in literature. See, for example, the role of the local bureaucrats in the work of uh, the Hindi novelist Premchand, but also in film, and particularly parallel cinema coming out of Bengal from the 1950s. Rinal Sen's Bhuvan Son follows the career of a, a railway officer in a corrupt department. The character of Mamo and Shyam Benegal's film of the same name visits Bombay from Pakistan and is forced to constantly bribe police officers for visa extensions. She pays a large bribe for a permanent visa, only to be subsequently arrested when the police officer is transferred. More recently, films such as Masan narrate the powerlessness of vulnerable communities in the light of police and government extortion. In the episodes these films depict, the predicament of minorities is but one example of a range of other communities for whom the negotiation of rights was problematic and for whom alternative means had to be sought. Part of the fascination here is that in film and literature, the government officer is invariably represented as a figure embedded in the society in which he, and it's nearly always a he, operates. As such, in these representations of corruption, we have tension between formal and informal, private and public family and state, which are each implicated in the other. And this obviously explains its dramatic efficacy. 
The passing of a bribe immediately involves the hidden, intimate and private as part of a larger public transaction. This is pertinent ultimately to the many ideas of citizenship that were explored and developed in this period, not least through discussions of corruption. Through it, citizenship is no longer a neutral, abstract, genderless phenomenon in which the public and private are discrete. The discussion of anti-corruption in domestic journals in the 1940s suggested that corruption was something that could be tackled in family contexts as well as in the public sphere. In this sense, as Raya Prokovnik has argued, it invites us to consider two gendered subjectivities in the idea of the citizen and the diversity of citizenship practices. What is also clear from the citizens' movements even in the late 1940s archives was that women in the informal sector were also active within them. The multiple social locations that they occupied represented the periods many faced everyday citizenship. So in this talk I've tried to explore the ways in which you might think of citizenship in South Asia as a phenomenon that was performed and changed by local circumstances. As such, it was constantly challenged and reconfigured, not just within particular places, usually cities, but also by the relationship between different places. <coughs> Ideally, with more time, I would talk a lot more about the city itself, how it was changed in all kinds of gendered ways, in Sindh, by the outmigration of Hindu communities, and UP, by the departure of Muslims. I would also like to talk about communities who habitually existed on the margins of normative citizenship. We've looked at the movement of partition refugees, but if we think of citizenship as contingent upon interrelated spaces, we might also consider how it has different applications for those habitually on the move, for whom international borders were porous. For example, India's denotified tribes or ex-criminal tribes. For these, a citizenship that cuts across the nation state and the idea of a fixed place whilst also relating to constitutional rights, is especially relevant. There are two further applications to this framework. Firstly, I would have liked to talk more about the Constitution of India, and in particular the long statement of fundamental rights. Article 19 sets out the rights of citizens to freedom of speech, the right to form associations and unions, and the right to move freely throughout the territory of India. Subsequent clauses talk about reasonable restrictions on those rights that the state may impose for reasons of sovereignty, integrity of India, or public order. But the means by which citizenship very quickly came to revolve around local movements, protests against old corruption, and competing rights claims in the late 1940s raises some interesting questions around this article. This is especially the case when we think of the recent controversies around declarations of loyalty to the nation in campuses across India. The causes of JNU and Hyderabad have a powerful root in the very making of this inherently contested citizenship in India and Pakistan's first few years. And of course, much reference has been made to the alternate notions of the citizen in these protests. Recent work, for example, that of Sumi Madhok, has explored the vernacularisation of rights movements, which borrow from global ideas of women's or citizens' rights. Contained in much of this writing are other themes of relevance, not least the relationship between coercion and agency in the exercise of rights. Secondly, I think we need to consider the idea of citizenship as not just a product of the dramatic events surrounding independence and partition for each state, separately. We need to explore how ideas of the citizen implicate both places in interrelated ways, not necessarily through the frame of the nation, but via connected cities or connected people <coughs> travelling between um, those cities. In theory, this has all kinds of very exciting implications, for how we might think about South Asia as a place overall, not simply as researchers of a region, but also in terms of interrelated cultural movements, connected histories, mutually independent ideas about political freedom, and quite a lot of this has come actually out today in today, some of the today's panels that I've, I've sat on. Citizens of India and Pakistan, after all, live together all over other parts of the world, and we might suggest that their ideas of belonging are mutually generated outside the space of the nation. Ultimately, however, however much governments attempt to profile them in elections for large city offices, um, their interests and their histories are tightly connected and ultimately collaborative. To find out more about membership to buses and the work of the association, Please visit our website at www.basis.org.uk